Perfect. I think uh, we could get started in interest of time. So um, welcome everyone uh, to the weekly Midas series. And uh, this week we are delighted to have Professor uh, Stefano Arman uh, join us from Stanford University. So uh, Stefano is an assistant professor of computer science at Stanford and his research interest is in probabilistic modeling of data, machine learning and computational sustainability. And Stefano has won a bunch of awards for his research, including best paper awards at AAAI, UAI, and several other conferences, as well as he has won several grants for his research, including an NSF career award. So ONR and Air Force uh, Young Investigator Awards, uh, Ichikai Computers and Thought Award, and several others. And uh, I think like I could spend the next half an hour like describing the laurels that Stefano has achieved, but I'll let Stefano take over and like describe some of his really, really interesting work on uh, the like the bleeding edge of AI for sustainable development. So Stefano, the floor is yours. Thanks a lot for the kind introduction. Let me share my screen. Can you see it okay? Perfect, yeah. Yeah, thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here. And uh, yeah, the plan is to tell you a bit about the work I've been doing at Stanford over the last few years um, on essentially trying to figure out ways to use AI to help solve sustainability problems, which is one of the things I'm really passionate about. And this is John work with many PhD students and, and other faculty members at Stanford. So let, let's uh, jump in, um, all right. So as you probably know, and, and you've heard in uh, previous uh, seminars in this series, there's been really a lot of progress in, uh, in artificial intelligence in the last few years, uh, in many subfields of AI. If you think about computer vision, we've gotten pretty good at recognizing objects and uh, classifying images into different categories. There's been a lot of progress in natural language processing, speech recognition, games, protein folding. Uh, the whole field of AI is really booming and there is like really a, a lot of excitement about what these technologies might be able to do for us. So it's, uh, it's pretty clear to me that they're going to change the world uh, and they're going to have a big impact in pretty much every sector of the economy and our society. Think about autonomous vehicles, algorithms making decisions for us, robotics. Uh, it's all very, very exciting. And so given this potential for changing the world, uh, what I've been thinking about is how do we use these technologies to actually promote the well-being of humanity throughout the world? How do we use them to make sure that they benefit essentially as many people as possible? So I've been thinking a lot about uh, issues of sustainable development. Um, it's a broad uh, area and, and perhaps it can be summarized pretty well by the, looking at the 17 SDGs the Sustainable Development Goals that were uh, identified by the United Nations as kind of the big uh, problems that our society are, is, is facing today. And you see problems like ending extreme poverty, hunger, uh, figuring out ways to deal with climate change, reducing inequalities throughout the world, uh, preserving biodiversity, and, and so forth. And so clearly, I, I think we can all agree these are super important problems. They're also very hard. Uh, and uh, a lot of my research has been focused uh, at least on the applied side on thinking about whether there are ways we can use all these technologies that we've been building over the last few years in AI and machine learning uh, to help us make progress on, 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 this, uh, on these really important challenges. And uh, in particular, after talking quite a bit with the domain experts at Stanford and other institutions, uh, one thing became pretty clear from the beginning that one of the reasons these problems are so difficult, especially if you think about problems like ending poverty or, or hunger, uh, is that we don't understand very well what's going on, uh, especially in the poorest part of the world. And this lack of data is really undermining our ability to, using the words of Kofi Annan from a recent nature paper, it's lacking, it's really undermining our ability to target resources, develop policies, track accountability. Uh, without good data, we're flying blind. If you can see it, you can solve it, right? And so uh, he's kind of referring to this problem that you know, the, with, if you don't have good data, you can set these targets like ending extreme poverty by 2030, but if you don't have a good way of measuring whether you're achieving these goals, it, it's kind of a, like a pointless exercise. And without data on the, about what's happening on the ground, it's hard to figure out if the policies governments are implementing are working or not. 
uh, figure out, you know, do social science research and figure out what works and what doesn't. Uh, everything is just hard when you don't have data on, on, uh, on the outcomes that we're trying to improve on the ground. So to, to make things a little bit more quantitative, we can take a look at goal number one, ending extreme poverty. Uh, the way people typically collect data on, on poverty is through nationally representative surveys. And these surveys are expensive and uh, they are not done very frequently. So we actually did a, a study where we looked at uh, pretty much every country in the world. We look at all the survey data that is available and we look how frequently as, are these surveys actually done. And uh, you see here, the countries are color coded by the interval that occurs between two surveys. Uh, and you can see that there are countries where there's no data available at all, uh, the black countries here. Uh, there are many countries where maybe there is, you have to wait till five or 10 or 15 years between two consecutive surveys. And so hopefully it's clear that with this kind of data, it's hard to figure out if things are working or not. It's hard to figure out if we're making progress or not, if you have to wait 10 or 15 years to, to get a new data point and see if, if the interventions you're, you're implementing are working or not. And the, the, the kind of trend that you probably see visually on, on the map is the kind that you would expect. Like if you look at the, the, the relationship between the, the, the number of surveys that are available and the GDP per capita, you kind of like see the, the, the relationship that you would expect. Uh, the poorer a country is, the less data you have access to. And if you look at the relationship between, uh, the, again, the availability of data and kind of like an index that measures political freedom, again, you see the kind of relationship that you would expect. Um, and it's not just the nationally representative economic surveys. If you look at Agricultural census is kind of a key inputs if you think about uh, food productivity, food insecurity, hunger. Again, very, very infrequent data. If you think about population censuses, again, kind of like a key input for a lot of the problems we're thinking about. Uh, they are not done very frequently and a lot of data is, uh, is, is, is kind of black. And the reason uh, these, these surveys are not done very frequently is just that they are expensive. You have to send people on the ground. You need to have a lot of uh, capacity, you need to have uh, the, the kind of other organizational skills to, 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 to implement these surveys and, and it's not easy in a lot of places, especially if, you know, if the infrastructure on the ground is not great, uh, it can be very, very expensive to, uh, to, to do this kind of interviews door to door and, and get the data that you need. And uh, that's why they are not done very frequently. And so one of the, the things that I've been really thinking about and working over the last few years is this idea that perhaps there are better ways, more scalable ways to uh, either replace or complement traditional survey data collection mechanisms uh, by leveraging uh, machine learning and AI and other kinds of uh, more unconventional but cheaper uh, data sources like from satellites, from phones, from social media, like data that is available relatively inexpensively all over the world. It's updated frequently and it does contain a lot of information about these kind of outcomes that we would like to measure on the ground if we can extract it automatically using algorithms, using uh, computer vision or natural language processing kind of tools. And uh, in particular, I'm going to focus a lot on, on satellites in this presentation. Uh, that's a space where there's been really uh, a lot of progress. Um, this is uh, what a village in Uganda would look like about 10 years ago using publicly available imagery. Uh, the resolution is not great. Like every pixel basically corresponds to an area of 30 meters by 30 meters. And this is great data, it's super helpful, but you just don't see much about what's going on on the ground with this kind of imagery. Uh, there's been a lot of progress, as I mentioned, in satellite technology. Uh, these days, you can get access to fairly high resolution imagery, like this one, where every pixel corresponds to a three meter by three meter uh, area on the ground. These kind of images are available everywhere in the world. They are updated extremely frequently, like maybe even every day. Uh, you can get a new image for every location on the world with this kind of resolution. And uh, so if you want, you can even get even higher resolution images. Uh, you know, these are like 30 centimeters kind of uh, high resolution images that are maybe collected less frequently, but they contain even more information about the stuff on the ground, infrastructure. You can almost count cars and containers on the, uh, on the ground in these kind of images. And so 
Uh, that's kind of like the, the promise here is that we have access to all these images. Uh, and these images are, are high resolution. They contain a lot of information about stuff on the ground and they're updated uh, very, very frequently, right? So we can try to compare um, the kind of frequency at which a typical household, let's say in, a, in, a, in, a, in, in Africa would show up in one of these surveys that are, as we saw before, done relatively infrequently. And if you do the math, it turns out that a typical household in one of in, in, in Africa would show up in one of these surveys uh, about once every a thousand years, right? Because the surveys are done not, they're not done very frequently and they are surveys, right? So they only sample a very small fraction, a representative fraction, but a small fraction of the population. And so a typical household would show up only once every thousand years. Uh, even in the US, uh, the, the kind of national where, where surveys are done um, more frequently, uh, you know, a typical household might show up in one of these surveys about once every 10 years, which is kind of like the think about censuses. Uh, on the other hand, uh, if you think about uh, satellite imagery, uh, a typical household, even in places like Africa, would show up in one of these images uh, about, let's say, once a week or maybe multiple times a week. Uh, and so if we had a way of extracting information from these images uh, about the kind of outcomes that we would like to measure and would typically measure using surveys, uh, that is kind of like creating a huge opportunity for, for, uh, for improvement. There's many orders of magnitude difference here in terms of how frequently and how more accurately we could uh, track how things are changing on the ground if we had a way of processing these images and, and making sense of them automatically. So that's kind of like the, the, the high level vision. If uh, we could build uh, some kind of like machine learning system that takes as input uh, these satellite images, high resolution, medium resolution, or a combination of, of them, and uh, it could somehow process them, figure out what's going on in these images, and uh, uh, use them to estimate socioeconomic indicators on the ground. Uh, this could be really transformative because it could really close this, this, this data gap that we've seen uh, exists on, on the ground for many of the outcomes that we, that we really care about. Uh, the challenge, the technical challenge, why this is also interesting from a, from a machine learning perspective is that although there is a lot of images, uh, there's not a whole lot of training data. That's precisely the reason we're trying to build these models. Uh, there is not a lot of training data available on the ground. So if you were to just, you know, it, it's not, uh, or it wouldn't work particularly well if you were to just take uh, some kind of your favorite uh, convolutional neural network architecture and train it end to end to predict outcomes of interest from the images uh, that might not work well because, you know, there's not a whole lot of survey data. Even the surveys that we have are relatively small samples of the population. So it's, it's not uh, particularly easy to develop these kind of models to predict uh, economic indicators from imagery. And so there are some interesting technical questions uh, that I'm gonna go into next on how to actually achieve high accuracy and good performance uh, using machine learning systems in a context where uh, the, the availability of training data is very scarce. And I see there might be a question. How do, should I, maybe just click. Uh, like what? Yeah. Um, is, yeah. Do you want to read the question? Should I yeah. read it? Yeah. So the question is, what's a typical household in Africa? Africa is composed of many countries and is more diverse than the US. Wouldn't we lose analytical power by ag aggregating data in such a huge and heterogeneous region of the world? And wouldn't a comparison of a whole continent to a country be ill-defined? Yeah, good question. I think uh, the, the way we do it is by essentially looking at the granularity at which the surveys are actually conducted, which is at the household level. Uh, and so what we did is was simply uh, doing the math and looking at, okay, how many surveys we have, how many households are actually surveyed, and then do the math of, you know, how frequently would a household show up in one of the surveys. And uh, yeah, we did the comparison with the, with the U.S. just to give out a uh, uh, to give a sense of what is the what is the gap there between kind of like uh, developing countries and, and more developed ones, um, I think if you look at the at the map that I showed you at the beginning, like we did a, a more I, I agree perhaps a more 
uh, fine grained comparisons. We actually compare country by country, and then you can look at you know what happens, for example, in Europe, and it's very similar to the to the U.S. in terms of the availability of data. Uh, there are other parts of the in the develop the, the developing world where you also have like uh, pretty big uh, data gaps, and so that the frequency of available data is relatively small. Uh, we've been focusing mostly on Africa, and that's what I'm going to talk about in this in this presentation. Uh, just because that's one of the places where the, the data gaps are the biggest and where my collaborators have done uh, a lot of work previously. And so that's mostly going to be the focus of this. But hopefully these technologies and, and are generalizable and they can be applied anywhere in the world. And uh, of course, the benefits are going to be bigger if you're working uh, in a situation where you know the, the bar is, is pretty low in terms of the, the availability of, of data at the moment. Does that answer your question or, or I'm happy to elaborate more? I think we are good to proceed, you know, so. <laughs> That's good. We can right. take we more follow-on questions at the end, yeah. Yeah, exactly, exactly. I'm happy to, to discuss more at the end. Uh, I think that the, the takeaways is just, just like to give a sense to, to let's say a computer scientist or a machine learning person of what is the gap there and the, the different orders of magnitude and, and mm -hmm. highlight the possibility of, of doing something big in this space if we were to build these kind of technologies. Uh, all right, so uh, how do we build uh, these, these models? Uh, one thing that has worked well for us uh, for training these models is to basically leverage um, other sources of data to provide weak supervision to our machine learning models. Uh, one that has worked quite well uh, for us is this idea of using uh, nighttime images uh, in addition to daytime images. So we have satellites that take images of the Earth both during day and during night. And the amount of nighttime light intensity that you see uh, tells you a lot about economic development. Uh, here you can see an image of uh, East Asia. Uh, you can see this is the Korean Peninsula and you see like the big difference between North, between you can see like how China and South Korea are, are very bright at night. And then that thing that almost looks like an island is, is, is actually uh, North Korea, right? It's very, very scarcely illuminated during night. And as you would expect, it's kind of like something that correlates with, with economic development. And so the, the idea is that uh, you could try to uh, train a machine learning system to predict uh, the amount of nighttime light intensity just by looking at daytime images. And if I ask you to guess, let's say which one of these two images is brighter at night, probably all of you would be able to guess. So the left one is gonna be brighter at night because you see cars, you see people, you see infrastructure, and you can guess that you know, that one has access to electricity and it's probably gonna be relatively bright at night compared to the one on the right. But in order to do that, you, know, you have to extract features in these images. You have to recognize cars and buildings and, and traffic and, and, and stuff like that. And so perhaps we can train a machine learning system to do the same kind of inferences. Uh, and so we can train a, a machine learning system to recognize these kind of features automatically by essentially trying to predict uh, the amount of night and light intensity from the daytime images. And the good thing about this task is that you basically have an infinite amount of training data because for every location on earth, you have both daytime images and nighttime images. So you can generate a training set as big as you want. You can fit the, your deep neural networks. And uh, indeed, by performing this nighttime light intensity regression or classification task, the hope is that you're gonna learn how to extract features uh, like the presence of, just like we saw in the previous example, like the presence of absence of cars and buildings and things like that, uh, that then you can transfer to uh, other kind of tasks that you might care about, like predicting poverty. And indeed, uh, this is one of the things that we did a few years ago, but it, it turns out that this works pretty well as a pre-training strategy. Uh, the system, if you look at the activation maps of some of the uh, the neural networks that we train for this daytime night and light intensity prediction task. Turns out that some of the activation masks uh, tend to recognize and look for roads. Uh, they tend to look for, let's say, bodies of water. They tend to look for traffic roads. They tend to look for buildings, uh, for uh, swimming pools. That's kind of like my favorite filter that was learned by this pre-training task. Uh, the model figured out that looking for swimming pools is useful for predicting night and light intensity. And indeed, hopefully that is a feature that can also be used for uh, estimate other kinds of socioeconomic indicators that we might care about. 
Uh, another source of data that we've been exploring and has been quite powerful uh, is essentially crowdsourced um, information like Wikipedia. Uh, it turns out that a lot of Wikipedia articles are actually geolocated. So there is a, like a coordinate box where you get the latitude and longitude of the, of the article. Uh, like here, you see the Nelson Mandela Bridge, and it tells you the location where the, the bridge is located. And uh, so what we can do is, and, and it turns out that there is a lot of these articles that are geolocated. If you plot the distribution of geolocated Wikipedia articles, uh, you get a map that looks like this. And what's cool here is that the, the, the shape of the continents was not overlaid on this map. It arises naturally just, just because that's where you know, people live and that's where people will, will write articles about things. So this, this kind of like emerges naturally. And uh, the, the, the thing is that you can kind of think of the Wikipedia article as being a very detailed caption for the corresponding satellite image. Uh, and uh, again, you can kind of use this information in the Wikipedia article as a source of supervision for a deep neural network. You can essentially try, try to train your deep neural network to predict properties of the articles from the images. Or maybe you can find some kind of embedding of the article uh, that captures the information contained in the text, and you can try to predict uh, those informations uh, using a, a convolutional neural network that will essentially try to force the model to look for features in the in the image that are useful for predicting uh, the content in the article. Again, you can generate a very large training set, and you can use this as a as a pretty powerful pre-training strategy. Um, and indeed, it tends to work well. Uh, you can then fine tune the network very easily to recognize different kinds of objects, uh, and it gives you big improvements in a variety of downstream tasks. Uh, another thing, I'm not going to talk about much about this, but the other thing you can do to get good features is to use self supervised learning. This is something that's been quite successful recently in traditional computer vision. Uh, you can also use it on, uh, on satellite images. Um, in particular, uh, we've been exploring several varieties of self-supervised learning methods applied to uh, geospatial data. So this, the difference between traditional images and satellite images is that satellite images are geolocated, so you know where they've been taken. Uh, and you can exploit that uh, indexing, that information to develop specialized uh, self-supervised learning tools. Uh, one that we've been, uh, that has been quite successful that we call tile 2 vec uh, it's kind of like inspired by WorkVac in NLP, uh, which is kind of like this hugely popular tool that is built on this idea that, okay, if two words appear in similar contexts, then they probably have a similar meaning. Uh, and we can kind of like leverage the same intuition and develop a pre-training strategy that will kind of try to enforce the fact that if two locations are close to each other, that they probably have a similar meaning. Uh, practically speaking, you can set up these pre-training tasks, like trying to uh, fill in patches uh, in, a, in an image uh, that will kind of like force the model to learn something about the meaning of these satellite images. Uh, you can even incorporate uh, data augmentations like in local SimClear via BIOL. Bio, uh, this is a recent ICCV paper that's coming out from my group, but there, is, there are several ways to basically use recent advances in, in, in computer vision and take advantage of even unlabeled data uh, to come up with good features that then can be uh, easily fine-tuned to solve a variety of supervised learning tasks. But it's kind of like the, the key takeaway of the first section of the talk is that there is a variety of techniques that we can use to essentially uh, take an image and extract a variety of good features. And uh, once we can do that, we can essentially uh, almost close this, this, we can almost solve this problem of training a machine learning system to predict uh, survey variables of interest from images, uh, because what we can do is we can look at the few locations for which we have survey data available in a country. Uh, we can acquire the corresponding satellite images. We can extract these good features, either using one of the pre-training strategies that I talked about or one of the self-supervised learning strategies that I talked about. And once you have the good visual features, uh, it's relatively easy to build simple models, like even simple ridge regression models or just fine tuning the networks. Uh, to predict the survey variables of interest, like poverty rates or population density or access to infrastructure, all the kind of things that we would like to figure out 
on the ground and we can try to predict them uh, from the images directly once we have good features. And uh, once uh, we have this model, the good thing is that you can then use it to fill the data gaps. Um, for example, once you've trained this model that predicts survey variables of interest from images, you can apply the model in locations for which you don't have uh, any kind of ground data available. So you can take a new location, let's say a new village in a country where you would like to figure out what's going on on the ground. You can acquire the corresponding image, you can fit it through the model, extract features, and build up and, and, and use them to predict um, survey variables of interest. Uh, you can even use it to make predictions in countries for which you don't have any survey data available at all. Uh, and there are ways like through leave one country out kind of cross validation to figure out how accurate this model is. And uh, uh, the, the, the end result is that we can build uh, continent wide uh, estimates of important socioeconomic indicators like asset wealth, kind of like indexes that are used by economists to understand um, the kind of assets people have access to in, in a household. These are kind of indexes that are built based on um, questions that they ask in the surveys, like, do you own a, um, a car? How big is your house? So do you own a refrigerator? Uh, do you own a TV? Uh, these kind of things are all used to build an index and we can uh, pretty accurately predict this index from satellite images and we can make these kind of estimates for very large geographies like the whole African continent. Uh, and uh, the good thing is that this, these estimates are very localized. They are very, uh, we can essentially make predictions for uh, compare different countries. At, you can zoom in and you can see what's going on, what the situation looks like on the ground, say at the level of districts. And we can go down at the level of individual villages, right? You can just acquire the images, fit them into the model, and you can get a sense of how wealth is distributed or poverty is distributed spatially uh, just using these, uh, these satellite images. And it turns out that the predictions that we make are actually pretty accurate. Uh, so we, we use these predictions that we made over the whole African continent, and we compare them to the available survey data uh, that we had access to. And it turns out that if you compare the, if you look at the R square that we get at the uh, at the village level, uh, we get an R square around 0.7, meaning that we can explain uh, almost 70% of the variation that exists uh, on the on the ground just by looking at satellite images. Uh, if you're happy with a little bit more aggregate estimates, let's say at the at the district level, uh, we're actually able to get um, R squares even higher from 0 0.7, 0 0.8. So it, it's uh, able to explain 70, 80% of the variation that exists on the ground just by looking at satellite images, uh, which, is, uh, which is extremely good, uh, especially uh, if you consider that the fact that there is uh, noise uh, in, the, in the data, even in the ground, what we consider ground truth in the surveys, there's always going to be measurement error. And so we wouldn't expect these predictions to be to be perfect, just because the outcomes of interest are measured with some some amount of error. And so you can even look at you know for some countries, sometimes it's possible to get access to two surveys that are supposedly measuring the same thing, maybe one done by the World Bank and one done by the local government office. And if you look at the kind of correlation between these two surveys that are supposedly measuring the same thing, again you're not going to get one because there is measurement error. And you see that the, the kind of agreement between two surveys uh, is, you know, the correlation is about 0 0.7, 0 0.8, 0 0.9. Uh, so it, it's a bit better, but it's kind of like comparable to the kind of correlations that we get uh, if we look at the predictions that we get from space with the, with the ground truth. Just kind of like suggesting that our estimates are actually, are actually pretty good and, and are almost as good as the ones you would get if you were to um, actually send people on the ground and, and collect it. Uh, the other nice thing about our estimates is that they are, they are cheap. So what this means is that we can not, not only scale them spatially over large geographies, uh, we, we can also keep them updated over time very inexpensively. Uh, the only thing that you need are images, which are relatively inexpensive. They are updated frequently. And so you can, as soon as you get new images, you can kind of fit them into your model. Uh, and use them to, to update your predictions and see how the situation is changing on the ground. Um, here you see an example in, in West Africa where we're kind of like comparing 
the, and you can Ghana versus Ivory Coast, then you can kind of see the, uh, the colors here represent the estimated change in asset wealth in this, at every location. And you can kind of see that the big difference between Ghana and Ivory Coast, where one is uh, estimated to have grown a lot uh, over that time period, where the other one has, has been estimated to not have grown at all, basically, uh, which is consistent with the fact that one had a big uh, civil war in that uh, during that time, so it didn't experience uh, much economic growth over, over that time period. So again, this is sort of suggesting of the kind of things you can do. You can start using these kind of estimates to figure out how things are changing on the ground. So it's pretty exciting from a policy perspective, from a um, even social science research perspective. People are starting to use these kind of methods to assess the, 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 the causal effects and figure out whether certain kind of interventions are working or not. And they can do it much more inexpensively because they have access to, to, to measurements that are much more uh, uh, inexpensive to, to, to acquire compared to, to, to traditional surveys. Uh, maybe, let me see. So Let's there's see. a quick question, uh, yes. Stefano. Uh, is this approach to satellite predicted wealth as accurate in different continents or regions of the world? So good question. So we essentially uh, only evaluated this in uh, most African countries. We also did India, where it also works pretty well. Other people have replicated the work. The so World Bank kind of replicated it in several Central American and South American countries, and they got pretty good results as well. I know some other groups did it in the Philippines. And uh, again, they were able to get uh, pretty good results, fairly comparable with what we got. So yeah, it seems like uh, the method works reasonably well. Um, I think I don't think anybody has tried it in, in developed countries, and I don't think it would necessarily work because maybe it would be harder to, to estimate the variation that we know exists on the ground if you were to look at uh, more urban areas, for example, uh, uh, because just just, you know, of course, you cannot see everything from space. And so uh, you cannot see inside people's houses, luckily. So uh, that uh, there are some limitations in what you can do. But in a lot of developing countries, I think the method has been tested and shown to work quite well. Right, then maybe I'll, I'll briefly mention, you know, there are other technical things you can do, like trying to develop semi-supervised learning uh, approaches to improve performance. Uh, again, kind of the, the idea is that although we have limited label data, very few locations that have labels attached to them, uh, there's a lot of unlabeled data that you can exploit and you can exploit it either uh, as a pre-training to set up pre-training kind of objectives to get good features, uh, you can also use it within your regression models to try to improve accuracy. Kind of like the, the idea behind semi-supervised learning is that if you have limited data, there is all kinds of decision boundaries that you know work that could separate, let's say, blue versus red class. Uh, but if you had a bunch of unlabeled data points, you know that might help you figure out what is a more reasonable decision boundary. Maybe you want to, you know, after if you just have six data points, maybe you think this is a reasonable decision boundary. Now, if I tell you, okay, here's a bunch of unlabeled data points, maybe you want to change your decision boundary, you want to do something like this, uh, which feels more natural and kind of there's this principle that uh, you should try to pick a model that reduces the uncertainty uh, of the predictions on labeled data. So you want to push the decision boundary as far as possible from the from kind of like the data manifold. And uh, there are ways to basically apply this in our context where we're doing regression. Uh, what we've done is we've basically used the Gaussian process to make predictions uh, with an associated uncertainty. And so whenever you get an unlabeled data point, you can kind of like feed it through this probabilistic model. Uh, and so it will not only produce an estimated number, but it will also give you a, an uncertainty envelope and it will estimate how much uncertainty there is associated with that prediction. And uh, the idea is that then you can use this uncertainty to set up semi-supervised learning objectives where you're saying, okay, let's try to fit the labeled data as well as possible, while at the same time trying to minimize the uncertainty at unlabeled data points, which essentially corresponds to this idea of, okay, let's try to change our, uh, oops, let's try to adjust uh, the weights and then kind of like change the, the, the features so that unlabeled data points become more similar to labeled data points. So that the uncertainty in the prediction is gonna be smaller. 
Uh, and uh, uh, there's uh, one more question. How yeah. do you evaluate the quality of features extracted during pre-training self-supervised learning methods, especially given the unnatured label of uh, un unlabeled nature of the images? Yeah, that's that's a good question. So there is a uh, there is a number of pre-training objectives that people have, have come up with, including Tal2Vec, Moco, SimClear, or predicting night and light intensity, predicting properties of Wikipedia articles. Uh, the way we then evaluate the performance of these features is kind of like saying, okay, now let's uh, pre-train this way using a lot of unlabeled data, and then let's see what the performance is. Uh, if you were to train a classifier or a regression model using these features on a variety of tasks uh, that you might care about using a very small amount of labeled data. And so it's kind of like a similar setup in traditional computer vision settings where people do pre-training or self-supervised training, and then they see, okay, how well will these features work on image and classification or CIFAR 10 classification? And the hope is that maybe you can get, get fairly high accuracy, maybe using a hundred labels or 10 labels, like very few labels. And that's kind of like what we are hoping to achieve here in the context of satellite images, a good uh, kind of like generic featureizer that extracts features that are then useful for doing a number of tasks, whether it's uh, uh, doing object detection, predicting poverty, land cover uh, classification. There's a variety of things you might want to do uh, given a satellite images. And the hope is that we can come up with good features that are useful for many of these tasks. And that's kind of like the typical evaluation protocol that we use in, in our papers. All right, yeah, so, and, and uh, as I mentioned, kind of the other way to use unlabeled data is directly through some supervised learning, uh, which can also give you pretty significant improvements, uh, like maybe 15, 20% reduction in uh, mean squared error um, using this um, uh, unlabeled data to minimize uh, predicted variance, basically. Uh, another issue that comes up that I think is opening up interesting uh, opportunities for uh, ML and, and AI research is scalability. Uh, as I said, kind of images are cheap, uh, compute is relatively cheap, and so uh, it's definitely much cheaper than actually sending people on the ground to collect data, but still it's pretty computationally intensive, like you need to process billions uh, of pixels or even trillions of pixels uh, in uh, in if you want to look at high resolution images uh, and uh, which can quickly become uh, a fairly significant bottleneck. And so uh, one of the things we've been looking at are essentially pipelines that are more adaptive. Uh, the idea is that uh, you might want to start processing uh, a large geographic area looking at say low resolution or medium resolution satellite images. And then based on that, decide what kind of high resolution images you're gonna acquire, uh, but try to do it selectively, right? If you see the medium resolution image on the left, uh, then maybe, you know, if you can choose between zooming in down there or zooming up or zooming in uh, where up there, where more probably more people live, you probably would choose to, if you can only pick one of the two, you probably pick the second one, right? And so that's kind of like the idea that perhaps we can automatically learn uh, kind of like when and where to acquire high resolution images. And you can think of zooming in uh, automatically. And the idea is that you can basically train a system to automatically decide uh, when and where to acquire high resolution images to let's say maximize accuracy while at the same time trying to reduce the compute or cost budget if you actually have to purchase high resolution images. So you can think of this as a reinforcement learning problem uh, where you're training an agent to decide where and where, when and where and what to look at to, to make as accurate predictions as possible where there's a cost in acquiring data. And uh, we've been pretty successful with this idea of training an agent that figures out you know, which tiles to acquire and acquires them, uh, process them, maybe doing object detection and then uh, uses them to make predictions. Uh, it turns out you can basically get roughly the same accuracy, uh, but it can be much more computationally efficient. Maybe you can reduce up to an order of magnitude the number of high resolution images uh, you have to process. So I think this is gonna be pretty, pretty. In it, it's, it's a pretty interesting problem from a, from a machine learning perspective, designing these adaptive um, data acquisition pipelines to, to enable scalability. It's a pretty cool problem also from an enforcement learning perspective, you can look up uh, the papers if you're interested but 
it's uh it's practically uh very useful when you want to scale these kind of models over very large geographies or very long time horizons because you can drastically reduce the the amount of data you have to process and the amount of data you have to acquire in order to make these predictions by being clever about selecting what you need and not and not even processing stuff that if there are regions where nobody's li nobody lives, uh, you know you can quickly figure that out. You don't even have to acquire those images. You don't even have to process them, and uh, you can train a system to do that kind of inferences for you automatically. Uh, and you know, just uh, maybe to to conclude, I'll tell you a little bit about the other kind of things we've been able to to do using similar pipelines. So far, we've talked about poverty, you know, food insecurity is another big problem. Uh, we've been we got some pretty good success uh, developing similar systems to let's say, understand agricultural systems from space. Uh, we've built uh, uh, machine learning models that can essentially process sequences of satellite images over time uh, and use them to, to estimate uh, this agricultural productivity. Uh, this demo is somehow is not working on my screen at least, but uh, we've been able to use you know, we started out in, in the US where we've shown that uh, these systems are actually pretty good at predicting uh, soybean or corn yield in the, at the county level in the, let's say in the, in the Midwest, in the US, uh, pretty accurately. It's pretty comparable to the kind of forecast that the Department of Agriculture can produce, uh, but we can do it from space, which is, which is cool because uh, it means that, again, it's, it's, it's a much more scalable technology. Uh, it means we can apply this in, in uh, developing countries. We've used it in, this is an example in Kenya where we're understanding uh, maize yields. Again, you can understand the spatial uh, distribution of yields uh, across different districts. Uh, and what's cool is that the resolution is very high. Like you can go down at the level of individual uh, smallholder plots and you can kind of like, get an understanding of which plots are producing well, which ones aren't, and you can do all of this from space in a, in a very inexpensive way. Like we can zoom in and, and to individual plots of land and we can figure out okay, how much maize in this case is being produced, uh, how do they compare to neighboring fields, and people are starting to use this kind of estimates to understand what kind of agricultural practices are working better, uh, thinking about where they can be used for uh, insurance purposes, uh, all kinds of interesting applications of this kind of data uh, for downstream policy and um, and uh, aid and other kinds of interventions. Uh, other things we've done are things like looking at infrastructure quality. Again, you can do a pretty good job at figuring out whether people have access to electricity, when they got access to electricity, uh, how reliable the electricity they have access to is, all things you can do pretty accurately uh, from space using machine learning. Uh, we've done a number of other things like understanding population density, tracking tents in refugee camps, we have a recent paper on understanding the spatial distribution of brick kilns in, in Southeast Asia, major polluting uh, factor in, in uh, some Asian countries. We've been able to map all where they are and how they're changing, whether they're close to schools and hospitals, lots of interesting kind of like environmental monitoring applications that are possible uh, using this technology. And uh, I'll briefly mention, uh, you know, it's not just satellite images. Uh, we've also ex been exploring uh, images collected at the ground level. Um, there is, of course, some things that you just cannot see from space. The resolution is not just good enough. So we've been thinking about combining what you can see from space, with what you can collect on the ground through crowdsourcing. Uh, so think of something like Google Street View, if you've used it before. Uh, Google Street View is great, but it's not available everywhere in the world. But there are alternatives that are more crowdsourced, like Mapillary in this case. Uh, there's a lot of crowdsourced uh, dashboard kind of like level uh, images and videos. Uh, collected all over the world. And as you can see from these samples here on the bottom left, again, they contain a lot of information about uh, what's going on on the ground. And uh, unlike, again, Google Street View, these are available everywhere, almost everywhere, as you can see on the map on the top right. And so we've been exploring this idea, okay, like, to what extent can you do computer vision on these images, uh, do object detection, and use this sort of uh, uh, 
features that you extract from the images to understand socioeconomic indicators on the ground. And it turns out you can do a pretty good job at uh, understanding uh, various kinds of economic indicators, even um, population health kind of indicators can be estimated uh, fairly accurately using, uh, using these street view images. So we're pretty excited about the opportunity of combining images taken from space with images taken on the ground and maybe be able to improve performance even, even more. And so, yeah, I think that's pretty much what I, what I wanted to, to talk about. Hope you had convinced, give you some examples of the kind of things that I can do to help us make progress towards these big challenges like ending poverty, hunger. Uh, of course, we're not gonna solve uh, any of them with an algorithm, uh, but I do think there is room for helping people come up with more quantitative solution to these problems, help them uh, figure out what is working, what is not. Uh, I think getting good data uh, is, is, a, is a key first step. And, uh, but I do think that potentially then once we have the data, there is all kinds of other interesting questions that we can ask about you know, how to allocate resources optimally, what kind of uh, causal inference questions about what is working and what isn't. Um, and so I think we're just getting started and uh, I hope we're gonna get more people interested in these problems. And we're trying to develop a community of researchers uh, in AI and ML who I think should uh, I'll pay more attention to these problems and uh, figure out ways to apply the skills we have and this amazing adva technological advances that we, we are seeing in, 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 in our fields to, towards problems that affect everybody in the world and, and I do think are, are the big problems our, our society is facing today. And uh, yeah, these are the students, funding, and yeah, I'm happy to awesome. take questions now. So awesome. Thanks so much, Stefano, for like, such a fascinating talk and for like very, very impactful work uh, that your group has been doing. So to, quick, to, to uh, kick things off, so I have a question for you. So uh, like your CNN models that you use for uh, satellite image uh, prediction. So like, how do you account for temporal shifts and non-stationarity arising due to weathers or cloud covers? So for example, if there might be cloud cover over South Korea, it might look like there are no lights there. And uh, so like this out of distribution shifts that happen over time, like, uh, is there a good way in your models to do that? Or like, you know, how do you deal with that? That's, it's, a, it's a great question. Uh, in fact, uh, it's, it's definitely something we've, uh, we've run into. Uh, I mean, cloud cover, okay, that, that's one that you can kind of like get around it because, you know, you can at least uh, restrict yourself to cloud-free images and get kind of, which it's typically possible, especially, because you know we're looking at things that don't change too rapidly, and so you can typically get at least one good image in a, let's say a year. Uh, but yeah, out of you know whether or not we can trust the predictions out of distributions uh, is, is is a challenge. I mean, especially like when we're trying to make predictions in a country where there is no training data at all. Like when we're trying to fill in the gaps in a country where we have some survey data, we have cross validation and this kind of typical tools that we all know to kind of like get a sense of how well we might expect the model to perform. When we try to go out of country, again, we try to do this, leave one country out cross validation where we say, okay, we pretend we don't have data for one country. We train on neighboring countries or every other country, make predictions and check out what we do. Uh, but then sure, that gives you a sense of how you might expect the model to perform if you try to use it in let's say Somalia, but we don't really know whether we can trust the predictions or not. Uh, it's actually uh, one of the students that did this, uh, this uh, poverty prediction work, the, the initial paper, uh, has been very, very interested in out of distribution uh, um, generalization uh, in the WILDS benchmark. Um, it, it's actually one of the tasks is actually this poverty prediction. So uh, if you, you know, have new techniques, uh, you should definitely experiment and try it out. I think it could be very impactful. Awesome. No, thanks. No, I think like that makes sense. You know, I'm uh, yeah, aware of the wilds data set. You know, I've been working with some students on some NLP problems for out of distribution shifts, but I just thought it was fascinating that, you know, you have all this uh, satellite images. So one question that I, uh, another question that I had uh, was, uh, so like, I mean, you know, this work by, you know, Fei-Fei Lee's group uh, where they use Google Street Views to predict poverty. I mean, and you briefly alluded to it at the very end, right? I think it was a PNAS in 2016. Yes. So like, I mean, I agree with you that the you know, street view is not available in like uh, most underdeveloped uh, like nooks and corners of the world. 
uh, but like for for regions where you have both satellite images as well as uh, 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 Google Street View, like what's the like maybe is it possible to benchmark to see like if you have satellite images, uh, are they like do they give highly high predictive accuracy compared to Google Street View or like Google Street View would be better in areas where you have both? That's a good question. I, I don't know if that analysis has been done, especially yeah, because if you have probably places where you have Google Street View are probably the ones where you don't necessarily, you would have a good amount of other probably survey data. And so maybe the, the, the data gaps are not as big. And so maybe people would not be as interested in using and using satellites. Uh, so on the other hand, I think, yeah, as you, as you said, Google Street View is not available in a lot of places. And the moment you start using things like Mapillary, like the quality of the images is so much worse. Like they're a lot less standardized and you have these images that are all like, you have a big cracks in the windshield and that's all you see. And, and uh, so it becomes quite a bit more challenging to, 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 to do the analysis and, and also interesting from a, from a technical yeah. perspective. Awesome. Uh, so there's a question in the chat. So is the reinforcement learning pipeline you've developed for deciding when a coarser spatial resolution is acceptable also applicable for picking appropriate temporal resolutions, sampling windows, etc.? Potentially, yes. Uh, I think we've not tried it out in a, in a temporal uh, setting. That seems like a pretty good <laughs> research problem to see whether it would work. I do think, yeah, it's a uh, We've had some success even in just the traditional computer vision problems, where sometimes like you can get away with uh, uh, sort of like a, you can just process images at a low resolution and you can still get the right answer, which can save you compute. Uh, and so, um, but again, it's only spatial and not temporal, and we've not explored this idea. Okay, do I need to look again in this region because things might have changed? I think it could be it could be quite interesting to to explore in that context. So, so regarding your comment about you know, using these bandit style approaches for adaptive data collection, I was intrigued by the fact that, that you could have satellites take high resolution images. So I was just wondering like, are these Landsat satellites? So where is this data coming from? Like, and, and could you take higher resolution images seriously? Like, that's just amazing. I think like if, if on demand, you could like choose high resolution images. So they, they are not necessarily on demand. So the, the way it works is that well, what's available is available. we're not controlling them in real okay. time. Okay. The thing is that you typically have to, well, if, if you want to process things in high resolution, like the compute cost and the storage cost can be extremely high. And typically high resolution images are not available for free or they might be available to some researchers, but you typically have to pay for them. There's quite a bit of uh, medium resolution, low resolution images that are publicly available through NASA or the European Space Agency. And so those are kind of like free and uh, you can kind of process that to, as a start. And then you can use that to decide, okay, if I have a certain budget for the kind of high resolution images that I can use, where should I allocate it? Maybe I don't have enough budgets to just tile a whole country in high resolution, but maybe I don't need to. Maybe, maybe it's similar to the way a survey is done where you, know, you don't have to interview every single household in a country to get a sense of what's going on. It can just be, uh, smart and kind of like places you sample. Yeah, so then there's another question. Is there an easy way to differentiate between land that is underdeveloped because of history of disadvantages versus land that is underdeveloped on purpose? For example, Yellowstone National Park or Masai Mara Nat Nature Reserve might look underdeveloped, but they are empty on purpose. Yeah, that, that's, a, that's a good question. Um, I think uh, there are certain limitations on what these systems can do. At the end of the day, they're, they're machine learning models and they don't know anything about, uh, about, uh, about the history of a particular location. So they do make mistakes. Um, we haven't particularly tried uh, figuring out what sort of things this model get wrong or not. Uh, but related to that question, some researchers here at Stanford are starting to use this models to understand uh, the effect of policy decisions and the way they do it is kind of like a uh, they, they're kind of like looking for discontinuity so they look at the areas between across the borders of two countries uh, which are geographically very similar probably have roughly the similar resources similar people living there and then they see whether there is a difference in the outcomes we care about across the two borders and if there is a difference that's probably due to 
uh, different policies being implemented in the two countries. Yeah, 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 yeah. absolutely. So uh, then there are a bunch of other questions uh, about your data. So like where can uh, like students who are interested in uh, <laughs> Uh, like satellite image data, like is it, uh, do you have to jump through lots of hoops to get this data or is it just downloadable? <laughs> great, great question. So we, we actually uh, submitted, uh, so there's this, I don't know, you probably know there's this new RIPS uh, um, track on data sets. Yeah. Uh, and so we submitted one uh, called Sustain Bench and it's uh, basically exactly trying to address this issue of trying to make it easy for researchers to apply their methods on these kind of data sets and problems. And so it's a pretty comprehensive benchmark of sustainability related machine learning problems. There's the poverty prediction, there is um, agricultural related things, uh, education, lots of different problems that are relevant to a particular SDG where we put together a, a data set that is, should be relatively easy to use, provide some baselines. And so it's on GitHub and uh, yeah, feel free to play with it. And yeah, we'd love to get more people involved. And yeah. hopefully it's gonna be more meaningful than trying to improve the accuracy on one of the standard uh, yeah. benchmarks. If you can actually improve the accuracy, maybe that will help you know governments or NGOs distribute aid more efficiently yeah, and things yeah. like that. Awesome. So then there is one comment uh, about, by Efren. So then there is a delete, uh, like, a, uh, like a long question by Dimitrios. So night lights are pretty coarse. Did you use any downscaling? Also related to night lights, they carry a bias. Example, a five lines highway will appear more prosperous than a city suburbs. Did you use any thresholds and filters to normalize that? Yeah, that's a good question. So in fact, researchers before us were using night lights to basically estimate economic uh, indicators directly. And they had some success, uh, but then there's just limitations on what you can do from because of the resolution, because there is a lot of villages that are completely dark at night, for example, but then they have this, they still have a lot of variation in terms of the economic outputs. So you cannot distinguish them if you were to just look at the amount of night and light intensity. So that's really what motivated us to say, okay, now we do need to look at daytime images and we're just gonna use night lights as a pre-training strategy to basically get features, uh, but then we, we are gonna use uh, daytime images to make predictions because there's just things you cannot do um, with night lights. Awesome. So I think like we're just uh, like uh, at time, you know, it's 5 p.m. I'm, I'm sure there are lots of other questions that, you know, that like the, all the audience has had because it, I think it's such a great topic uh, and such a great talk. Like I wish this was uh, being held in person so we could, you know, have held on to you for another couple of hours. <laughs> to answer all next time. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully next time. So yeah, so, so James, uh, so um, uh, like how do we go from here? Like this is my first time doing this. Okay. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> no, Pramvir, thank you so much for, for handling the, uh, the Q and A. And I'd say, because we're at time, um, I'd say this is, this is the perfect stopping point. So I'd like to thank Stefano for joining us. I'd like to thank Pramvir for, uh, for hosting, handling the introduction and, and moderating the Q and A. And um, Stefano, I'm sure, um, are, are you okay if people reach out to you, if they've, if they've got further questions, anything like that? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Feel free to reach out to me by email or something. Absolutely. Well, perfect, everyone. Well, I think this is where we can call it. So I hope that everyone has a good evening. Uh, if you're, you know, on the West Coast, like Stefano, have a good rest of your afternoon. Uh, and we'll see you at next week's uh, seminar series. Same time, same place. Thank you. Thanks, thanks, thanks for having me. Bye-bye. Yeah. All right. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye.